So today's video, we've had tons of requests for. It's a respiratory disorder that affects up to 300 million people worldwide. And that disorder is asthma. So we're gonna dig deep into this video and we're gonna talk about the causes of asthma, how they diagnose and treat asthma, potential triggers that kind of flare up asthma for people who have it, and obviously the relevant anatomical awesomeness. So let's get to it. So the classic presentation of asthma is intermittent cough, shortness of breath, or dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, and wheezing. And these symptoms tend to be episodic, meaning they'll come and go. However, we can't solely define asthma based on those three symptoms or clinical presentations because there's other respiratory disorders or illnesses that can come with cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing. So let's go a little bit further. People with asthma, or asthma itself, is known to be what's called bronchial hyperresponsiveness. In other words, their bronchial tree is more responsive or reacts to stimuli that don't necessarily affect people who don't have asthma. So to go into a little bit more detail of what's going on with this hyperresponsiveness of the airway, let's take a look at the cat cadaver dissection. So this first dissection I'm going to show is a trachea. Now there's some other things above the trachea like the thyroid gland and the voice box or the larynx and some tongue anatomy, but we're really going to focus on the windpipe right here, which again is called the trachea. Now there's a couple of things we really want to focus on when it comes to asthma and how the anatomy of the airway affects asthma. If you look closely, and I'll bring this closer, you can actually see these little rings. These are actually cartilaginous rings that help open or keep the airway open. Now they're not full rings. If I turn it over to the back side, you can see there's just a membrane and they're more so like horseshoe shaped cartilage rings, I guess you could say. Now these are really important because they keep the airway open. But since they're not full rings, you do still get some flexibility in the actual respiratory airways as far as how it can change its diameter. Now, in that membrane that I'm showing back here, there's actually a lot of smooth muscle. Now, smooth muscle in the human body is muscle tissue that is not under voluntary control. So your autonomic nervous system, or the part of the nervous system that just does things in the background, does this on its own. And what can happen with people with asthma is this smooth muscle can actually react or spasm. Now, when an airway constricts, we call it bronchoconstriction. And in this case, if it spasms, they'll change the name or say a bronchospasm. So that's one component of asthma that we have to focus on. If there's some stimulus or some allergen that makes somebody's airway react, they can get a bronchospasm and that can make it difficult to breathe. Now, a couple other points I wanna make with this. I wanna show the other dissection here. So if you take a look at this, this is actually a unique dissection. Uh, one, because this is a right lung and normally right lungs have three lobes and this one's unique because it actually only has two lobes, one and two, and we'll focus on that in a different video. But I wanna show you guys, here again is the trachea. Now we've cut it in half and so you can actually see the inside of the lining of this trachea running right through there. And we'll get to that again in a moment. But what happens with the airway from the trachea is it continues to branch and branch and branch. You start from the trachea and you go to a main bronchus or principal bronchus you go to then a secondary bronchus or a lobar bronchus, and then you go to these tertiary bronchi or what we've known as segmental bronchi. And I can show you a little bit of that on the actual cadaver here. If you look as it's branching into the lung tissue, you can see these branches coming down and branching into certain areas. And if I lift a little higher, you can see those branches coming down as well. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, remember those cartilaginous rings. Those cartilaginous rings or horseshoe shaped rings are more prominent in the upper airways. As you move down, they become less prominent and more interspersed. And actually when the bronchi branch smaller, we call them bronchioles. And they're almost non-existent when you get down to the deeper bronchioles. However, the smooth muscle tends to get more robust or more prominent. So think about this during a bronchospasm with asthma. If those smooth muscle cells really constrict, that can be a problem if there's no cartilage to help hold it open, say in those even lower airways or those bronchioles. There are certain situations where they can constrict so tightly, it'll completely close off a bronchial down in the lower airways. So that's one of the concerns that we have to address with asthma. That smooth muscle, the cartilage lacking in the deeper airways, and that constriction or bronchospasm. 
The other component that we have to focus on is inflammation. There's a major inflammatory component with people with asthma. And I want to show again this dissection. So if you take a look here, I'm going to open up the airway here. And this is the inside of the trachea. Now the inside lining here is actually referred to as the tunica mucosa. And it's the inside lining of the tube, the mucosa, because it produces mucus. Now that lining can also get inflamed. And when things get inflamed, think about when you've sprained an ankle or you've had some level of inflammation with um, a sore throat, the tissues puff up because in a way they swell up from the inflammation. Imagine the inside lining of that tube now getting puffy and swelling up. That will also contribute to the narrowing of the tube. Not only that, the cells also lined in that tube will also tend to produce more mucus. So think of the three things that now can block the airway during an asthma attack or somebody just who has chronic asthma that's not well controlled. You have bronchospasm where the smooth muscle is constricting the airway. You have inflammation of the inside lining, that tunica mucosa, which can also kind of thicken that mucosal lining and then also producing excess mucus. People can get what's called mucus plugs that are another way to just plug in the airway and block the airflow from going down into the lung tissue. So now that we have an idea of what's going on in the airways, we can kind of really explain those three symptoms that we mentioned, the cough, the shortness of breath, and that wheezing. Whenever there's air trying to go through a narrowed tube, it can make a noise. And you can hear that when you auscultate, auscultate the lungs during, say, like an exam at the doctor's office. They'll put the uh, stethoscope on the lungs and listen and hear the wheezing in different lobes or different areas of the lungs. You'll also notice a lot of times their heart rate will go up uh, just because their body's trying to compensate. And if you guys have ever been to the clinic and they've ever put that pulse ox on your finger, measures oxygen levels in the blood, that often can be decreased when people are having an asthma flare. But what are causing these asthma flares? What are these triggers or stimuli that are causing the asthma to flare up? Well, we have a list of these things that we're going to talk about here. We have allergens, and that can be a lot of different things from pets to dust mites to other things that people are allergic to. That list can go on and on. Upper respiratory tract infections can flare up asthma, so like the common cold. Exercise, people have exercise-induced asthma. Cold air can be another stimulant that causes an asthma flare. Gas or chemical irritants that are in the air that somebody breathes in. Also, you'll see certain drugs. Beta blockers, and we'll talk about why beta blockers can be a flare in a little while when we talk about medicine. Also, asthma, or I'm sorry, aspirin can cause um, an asthma flare. And one that's really interesting is stress or emotional conditions. I need you to wrap your head around this. Tomorrow night, Allegra Cole could have her last first kiss. So what if you haven't been diagnosed with asthma, yet you're suspicious that you may have it? Or maybe your clinician or doctor is suspicious that you have it. How will this be diagnosed? Well, often they'll use what's called pulmonary function tests, or PFTs. And I'll mention a couple of these different types of TF, uh, PFTs, and one of them is called spirometry. And with spirometry, what you do is you take a really, really deep breath in, and then you have a forceful, quick exhalation and you'll breathe that or do that into something called a spirometer, hence spirometry. And they'll get readings based on that. Now, say your readings are low or they're below average. What they may do after that is do a bronchodilator response test. In other words, if, they're, if you're low on spirometry, they're suspicious of asthma, they'll give you a bronchodilator, and which is a medication to help relax the smooth muscle in the bronchial tree. And if you improve a certain percentage, that makes it more likely that you have asthma. These are little diagnostic keys to be like, okay, we have this and we have this, asthma is more likely. Now, there are some people who will do spirometry and breathe into that spirometer and they'll be normal. But they have this history of cough, shortness of breath, but that day they're okay. So sometimes what they'll do is a bronchoprovocation test. In other words, they're trying to provoke a bronchospasm. So they'll have the patient inhale something, a substance called mannitol, and that can cause bronchoconstriction. And if you have asthma, you're going to be more sensitive to that substance that you breathe in. The mannitol that I mentioned is one of the examples you can use. And that again can give them a key or a cue that that person may have asthma, especially if they can reverse it with a bronchodilator. So finally, how do we treat asthma? Allegra. Yes? 
Hold on. Yes, we're going to toss that asthma inhaler right before you kiss the person of your dreams, just like Albert Brenneman did in that clip. It's kind of epic and cool and funny and awesome. However, probably not a good idea because just a little tangent here. I cannot tell you how many times I have a patient come into the clinic, they're having an asthma attack, and they can't find their albuterol inhaler. So hold on to that thing, maybe put a tracking device on it. But in all seriousness, remember asthma had two main components that we had to focus on here. We had a bronchoconstriction or a bronchospasm problem, and also an inflammatory problem. So often we have to deal with both depending on how severe the case of asthma is. Some people can just get away with what we call a bronchodilator. And these are the inhalers that you often see people use in the movie clips that we showed. And these have a medicine, usually albuterol or leave albuterol. What do these medicines do? Again, I mentioned they're bronchodilators. They're known as beta agonists because they bind to beta receptors and they stimulate them. Just a little clip to the beginning. Do you remember I said beta blockers can actually stimulate an asthma attack? They do the opposite of what the medicine for asthma actually does, which is relax the smooth muscle. And that takes care of the bronchospasm problem. But what about the inflammatory component? Well, as asthma gets to more moderate to severe stages, we tend to need to use these things called inhaled corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation of that mucosal lining and of the bronchial tree. An example medication of this is something called budesonide, and that's just one example of an inhaled corticosteroid. Now, a benefit of inhaling a corticosteroid rather than actually taking it in pill form is you tend to have less, less systemic side effects and that can really get the medicine concentrated in the lungs. Will there be some of the medicine that gets into the bloodstream? Yes, but it's a lesser effect on other systems, say, than if you took a pill form. That doesn't mean we won't ever use a pill form, which we'll get into in a minute. So what if somebody came up with this idea? What if we made an inhaler that both had a beta agonist, something that helps with bronchoconstriction or bronchospasms, mixed with an anti-inflammatory steroid? And they do. They have combination inhalers where they have these long-acting beta agonists, something called formoterol. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but that's just one example, combined with budesonide. And they can take that every morning. It helps with the bronchospasm as well as the inflammatory component. But let's even go further. What if somebody's using all those medications and they're following their asthma protocol, but they still have this flare and they don't know what is causing the flare? Well, oftentimes that's when they come into the clinic and see, it, see us. What we'll do a lot of the time is we'll assess them, see how severe they are, do they need to go to the hospital, can we kind of address them in an outpatient setting. Now, a lot of times in the clinics that I work, we'll give them a breathing treatment or what we call a nebulizer treatment, which is, you know, five to ten minute treatment of a bronchodilator. And then often we'll send them home with oral steroids. Now, a lot of these patients have had inhaled steroids, but we almost need to burst them, give them a high dose burst of steroids to get them out of this inflamed state or this flared up state of asthma. And oftentimes five days of those medications do a pretty good job of pulling people out of those major flares of asthma. So thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully that gave you some more information on asthma and just wanted to let you guys know we're still partners with these guys. And apparently this is what happens when you control your asthma well, flowers bloom from your thoracic cavity where your lungs are. And that sounded a little bit creepy, but oh well. Anyway, hope you guys have a good time, good day, and give someone a hug because we need it in the United States right now. I'll go hug Justin right now. <laughs>